Jeff, Sally, friends, <clears throat> it's indeed a great privilege and an honor to be here. And the story that uh, Jeff related about our first meeting is something that's fixed on my mind indelibly because it's only unusual uh, incidents and occurrences like that which uh, really bring people together. And I can tell you, he, of course, uh, naturally, in the interest of time, he omitted some of the details. But what kept me going that night when Larry kept phoning me from his um, satellite phone, uh, saying that the roads are blocked, the road through Bawali is uh, closed, you'll have to come through an alternate, alternate route, spend the night wherever you can and come in the morning, but I had a driver in my vehicle who was almost as mad as I am. And he said, no, we'll keep going. We'll see, we'll reach there at some stage. But what was most interesting was one particular area where there was literally a river flowing uh, down the mountain. And we saw a line of cars and trucks lined up on both sides, obviously fearsome about uh, crossing that river or stream which had come into existence. So I waited for a while, and then I saw a truck actually cross the place. So I told my driver, I said, let's back up, speed up, and I'm sure we'll make it. <laughs> and we did. We reached at 3 o'clock at night, and um, there was a straw mat just outside the place where I asked my driver to lie down, and I sat in the car, didn't sleep very much. But that was a wonderful experience. Uh, Jeff, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. This has been an extremely inspiring experience. And I'm so impressed with the power and promise of the school awards, the work that the school center is doing. Um, and you, you're really uncovering hidden heroes of society. And some of them perhaps would never have got known and see the enormous benefit you're creating by encouraging those who are not yet on the scene. But there will be many on the scene because this inspiration will travel. It's going to encourage, it's going to light a spark in the minds and hearts of so many others who can really make a difference. I have a feeling that social entrepreneurs might just prove to be the missing missionaries that we need for a fair and just society. I think there are two major implications from what social entrepreneurs are doing across the world. Firstly, I think they can fashion, they can develop a new development paradigm, which is based on culture, which is in tune with grassroots aspirations, sentiments, and values, which unfortunately we seem to have lost over the years, ever since industrialization began. I think the second important implication is that social entrepreneurs provide a form of governance which is extremely powerful, very compelling. It's not going to supplant existing institutions, but it can powerfully supplement them. And I think the work that social entrepreneurs do set a benchmark, set standards that would actually even move governments to do the right thing. So I believe that if one looks at the prospects of attaining sustainable development on this planet, I think those who will be in the vanguard will be social entrepreneurs. It's quite obvious that unmitigated forms of capitalism and extreme socialism have failed to address the challenge of sustainable development. As a matter of fact, both systems have proved to be antagonistic to this cardinal objective, which I think lies at the root of human progress and welfare. So the question is, how can social entrepreneurship provide an alternative path of development? I think this is a question which is, which is going to be answered, is being answered only by the actions of those who are present here and thousands, hundreds of thousands others 
who are working in the same spirit all over the world. I believe what is at stake over here is the ability to create human progress without unsustainably um, consuming the resources of nature and the wealth that we have on this planet. And when I talk about wealth, I'm certainly not talking about material wealth. I'm talking about the natural wealth that each one of us has inherited. I'm reminded, and I'm sorry if you've heard me say this before on other occasions, Mahatma Gandhi, who I quote extensively because he was clearly a person ahead of his time, who was able to visualize the perils and the problems of an unsustainable path of development. On one occasion, he was asked by a British reporter, I believe, Mr. Gandhi, wouldn't you want India to reach the same levels of prosperity as Britain? And he thought for a moment. He said it required Britain to use half the resources of this planet. How many planets would India require? And I really think what we need to do is to look at how we have extended the footprint of human activities far beyond the ability of ecosystems to be able to absorb this major burden that we have placed on them. So the real challenge that I see is to be able to understand and to grasp the implications of a path of sustainable development. Gandhi, in his various ways, did easily define that path, but I'm afraid most of us have forgotten that. And we were given a reminder of this by another great leader, Mrs. Brundtland, who in the commission that she chaired came up with a definition of sustainable development, which in very simple terms says that it's that form of development which meets the needs of the current generation without compromising on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now this seems like a very simple definition, but it's laden with value. It's laden with value because it clearly establishes the importance of intergenerational equity. And it clearly brings to the fore the importance of issues of equity. I think the world has to become responsive to the efficiency of natural resource use and to the implications of intergenerational and intragenerational equity. Everybody says the 21st century is going to be a century of knowledge, but that knowledge is certainly not going to be confined only to science and technology and what we have come to believe as the indicators of modern progress. It's knowledge which will have to be based on wisdom, on values, and indigenous knowledge. And not all recent knowledge has been well directed. We know that very well. And therefore, I would say knowledge also implies unlearning a few things that we have learned over the years. Because if we don't unlearn some things that we know are patently wrong, then obviously we're not going to change. And the inertia in the system will stop us from moving in a direction that essentially will ensure the welfare and well-being of generations yet to come. When it comes to sustainable development, I think we do understand the biophysical impacts. We think of it in terms as damage to the environment which should be protected. But there's much more to it than that. Of course, the physical impacts are very important. And here, let me highlight the fact that sustainable development is really a much larger dimension than the problem of climate change. Climate change is essentially a subset of the fact that we have pursued a path of unsustainable development. And we know that this is going to impact on some of the poorest communities in the world in a terribly inequitable way. The fourth assessment report of the IPCC has clearly brought out the fact that we are facing an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events, heat waves, floods, droughts, and all kinds of other occurrences where the poor and those who don't have the wealth and the income to be able to protect themselves are really extremely vulnerable. 
And I would say this is also true of those who are not healthy, are old, infirm, because as we've seen, even in rich societies, if you look at what happened with Hurricane Katrina, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that this was the result of human-induced climate change, who were the worst victims of that occurrence? It was the poorest of the poor who were left behind, several of whom lost their lives. If you look at the heat wave of 2003 that afflicted a large part of Europe, those who lost their lives were the elderly. They were children, they were infants, who really were not able to withstand this enormous increase in temperature which took place over a short period of time and reached peak levels. We also know the vulnerability of the small island states and low-lying coastal areas. In the IPCC fourth assessment report, we have brought out the vulnerability of the so-called mega-deltas, cities like Shanghai, Dhaka, Kolkata. These are large agglomerations of human population with a number of built uh, uh, structures and, of course, very vulnerable to coastal flooding to cyclonic activity, to the problems of sea level rise. And we already see that whenever there is an occurrence which affects these cities, the, the extent of damage is enormous. We also know that if temperatures were to increase beyond the range of 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius, 20 to 30 percent of the species that have been assessed by the IPCC will be at threat of extinction. It's also known that in continents like Africa, as early as 2020, we would have 75 to 250 million people who are going to live in conditions of water stress as a result of climate change. And this is a continent that is already under all kinds of stress. We also know that in the case of agriculture, some of the crops grown on that continent as early as 2020, may find a decline in productivity and yields uh, of up to 50%. So there is clearly an equity dimension, an ethical dimension that we cannot possibly ignore because the problem of climate change, and I would say the global pursuit of unsustainable paths of development, is not something that has been initiated or pursued by the least developed countries, the developing countries of the world. That's something which has really been pursued and established by the developed countries of the world. And therefore, I would submit that while we understand the mind and body of sustainable development, we have not really come to grips with the soul of this concept, the soul of this direction, which of course has guided human civilization for thousands of years. And therefore, what we need is a very clear focus on how we might be able to find the soul of sustainable development. In this regard, may I submit that this is the kind of thing that perhaps the school center could focus on. This is the kind of thing that all of those who are working, the, the very hardworking, the dedicated, the innovative, social entrepreneurs who are here can really start addressing by telling your constituents, those who are your partners and that you work with, to bring about changes in lifestyles. Because unless we do that, technology by itself is not going to make a difference. And I think even the pressure, particularly in democratic systems, on leaders to take the right steps and to devise the right policies will come from a realization in, among the public that we have to bring about a major shift in lifestyles. I've been speaking about this subject uh, in several uh, cases, and one of the things that's made, that's made me quite unpopular is my advocacy to reduce the consumption of meat. Um, I have been saying that if you eat less meat, you will be healthier and so would the planet. And as a matter of fact, I get a number of emails in response. One of them said that you're obviously a vegetarian <laughs> and, and you're not getting adequate nutrition and that's affecting your brain. 
I, I made a speech uh, in London several months ago, and the Lord Mayor of London wrote an op-ed piece in the Daily Telegraph in which, he, in which he said, no, Dr. Pachori, I'm going to gorge myself. I'm going to eat much more meat. I'm not going to cut down on uh, meat consumption. So I had to respond to that, and I said, uh, well, I believe uh, the Lord Mayor travels by bicycle to work. If he's going to eat much more, he'll probably have to bicycle a lot more. And if he does that adequately, he might even qualify for the Olympics that are going to be held in his city. So I, I, I think there are several elements of our lifestyles which really need question. And I think we have to develop an attitude by which we can bring about a major shift. And I was very happy to hear the term shift being used last evening because we are clearly at a stage where tectonic changes are required. I don't think we can make any difference by taking small steps. We are at a critical juncture in human history, and unless we develop the realization and the resolve to be able to make a major shift, I'm afraid we are going to regret it. Our children and our grandchildren are going to regret it. Now, here is where I would like to pay a very humble compliment to Jeff Skoll and the Skoll Foundation, because I think you've raised the intellectual level of the kind of effort that is required and the kind of effort that is being made by so many dedicated social entrepreneurs across the world. I believe this can and has the potential to change the map of the world. And I believe that this is something based on the manner in which you organize this event and all your activities can really create awareness all around. I was very happy to read the article in The Economist which essentially highlighted several initiatives uh, that are being carried out by social entrepreneurs across the world. There is one particular initiative that I want to bring to your attention because I find it a tragic reality that stirs my, my heart, my soul. And this is the fact that there are 1.6 billion people in this world who have never seen an incandescent lamp in their homes who don't have access to electricity. And this, to my mind, is a massive tragedy. If you were to calculate what it would require to give these homes solar lighting, and I'm going to show you something on that in a while, it would cost no more than $20 billion. And at the last count, about three months ago, I estimated what the recovery package is going to be all over the world in the light of failures that have taken place and where we are essentially holding hands with those who have caused these failures, I'm afraid that amounted to something like $2.7 trillion. So there is something terribly distorted in the way we are taking decisions at the global level. And here I want to highlight the fact that I am partly underemployed, as I was telling Jeff, I have two responsibilities. One is my institute, which has over 800 people uh, in India and in other parts of the world, and chairman of the IPCC. I've also accepted another responsibility, and that's to be a part-time director of the new Institute for Climate and Energy, which is being established at Yale University. But my mission from now on onwards is going to be one particular activity, and that's to see that we light up a billion homes. And for that, I'm going to show you a very brief film, which I would request may now be played.
Well, symbolic of what you've just seen, I'm going to give Jeff a small present. This is a solar torch or flashlight, which has a solar panel on it. And I'm going to extract a promise from him that if he gets up in the middle of the night, he won't switch on the lights. He'll just use this torch. <laughs> just, yeah.